So hello everybody and welcome to our um, Social Work Action Network podcast on fear in social work. Uh, we are joined today by Professor Brian Littlechild of the University of Hertfordshire, who um, has a particular interest in uh, looking at working with violence and aggression in social work and social care settings, um, primarily safeguarding children and uh, mental health, but also looking at the role of fear in practice in social work. Um, so we're over the moon to have Brian joining us today. We've also got Dan Morton, who is an adult social worker in West London and um, a long-standing um, member of the Social Work Action Network. And we've also got Laura Owens, who is uh, based in Scotland and um, is a former social worker, but is currently a lecturer at a further education college in health and social care. So we're all here today to talk about fear in social work, which I think is talked about in offices or over the phone a lot with our colleagues, but perhaps isn't explored um, as a kind of, almost as an academic subject or as a real feature of our practice in its own right. So that's what we're gonna do today. So I'm gonna start um, really by going to Laura as a former social worker where um, fear played a part in, in Laura and you choosing to end that part of your career story. So we're gonna start by look, just hearing for a few minutes from yourself, if that's okay. Okay, <coughs> uh, hi, thanks so much um, for having me along, hey, Alicia, um, and introducing me. Yeah, so um, my story sort of started when I was very young. Uh, I had um, this ambition that I wanted to be a social worker long before I really truly understood probably what the role of a social worker was. Um, and I know I'm not, I'm probably not unique um, in having that kind of situation. Um, I, I, I suspect I had quite a naive, oversimplified view of what social work was and, and what a social worker um, um, did. Um, but I got into it, I got into it quite young. I was really, really fortunate that um, I was given the opportunity um, to do my degree through the Open University, which meant um, that basically my employer supported me with that. Uh, and at the time, I was able to continue to work um, within the local authority. So during that period of studying, I gained an enormous amount of experience um, working with, with a variety of different um, client groups, services or groups. Um, and, and it really, it, it, was, it was really, really valuable. Uh, as I said before though, um, when, I, when I got into social work, I was only 21 at the time. Um, and looking back, that just seems so incredibly young. And uh, I, I do think that there was an element of naivety about what um, I might be faced with. And a lot of people make the assumption, I think, that having worked in social work or experienced social work, that the challenges often come from uh, working with service users. But my experience was never, or, or the challenges or the fears and the anxieties was never working with service users. The fear often came from um, the, the structures with which I had to work within and, and the restrictions um, and the, the, um, what I learned very, very quickly as I, as I kind of progressed through my career was that social work, I think um, it's fair to say ha, ha, there has been a, a blame culture created and that um, on the individual social worker. If, and for me, as I sort of kind of went through my career, I had real periods of stress and anxiety that I'd never known before in my life. And I kind of put that down to the fact that I felt at times, and most of my career was spent in children and families, that if anything was to go wrong, that it would be me that got blamed. And I felt very, very isolated in that experience. Um, it was almost like you couldn't ever really put your hand up and say, I'm struggling. And on the occasion that I did, and I, I reached burnout probably, um, I'd maybe been doing it about six years and I had reached burnout. Um, and I did, I put my hand up and said, I'm struggling here, I'm stuck. Um, and it was very much pushed back to me as an individual. Uh, and that the problem was, was kind of lay with me and I had to look at me and myself. Now, 
that's okay to say that and to reflect on you as part of your social work training you understand you have to be reflecting on yourself all the time and the impact you have on other people and all those kind of things but what it that attitude kind of left me feeling was that I wasn't good enough and that maybe I was had just been naive and 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 um that I, I wasn't cut out for for the career um and as I say I, I, the admittance that, that I had been stressed was that that ended my career I stayed in social work probably for about a year and a half I actually took a, a career break at the time um, and uh, and then came back with a sort of fresh head but when I when I did come back after after being not well and then coming back and kind I of fighting fit and protecting myself a wee bit more within what I think was quite a toxic environment I decided at that point that I wasn't going to continue with the career anyway I, I believe that I was often fighting against the tide my sort of ideology of what social work was wasn't fitting in with the reality of what I was seeing and I decided that at that point I, that I would I would look for a different career and that's when I got into further education and the difference for me um, uh, and, and this is somebody who's who I grew up wanting to be a social worker that was my identity that was something that I was so passionate about I was so passionate about fighting for people's rights and, and standing up for people and and think a lot of people think social work because they want to help that that that's that was me I was the sort of stereotypical uh you know want to be social worker and that's what that's what I, I wanted to do but the ideology that I had didn't meet I was in constant conflict with the system um and the difference as I said between my experience in social work to then moving into education was like night and day where I thought in social work I was going to help people and support people and fight for their rights uh, and and be and and have my passions heard and 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 that didn't happen. I was often shot down. I was often encouraged to blame the individual for their problems. Whereas when I went into uh, further education, the difference was all of a sudden we were allowed to have faith in people. We could we, we were allowed to have some sort of a uh, you know, hope that people could be in a better position in some months or a year's time. And I felt like that for a long time got kicked out of me in social work, or there was certainly an attempt to kick that out of me, um, which, as I say, uh, landed in, in me leaving the career, which which it makes me quite sad. Um, I, I'm sounding very cynical and for any future social workers that that's not that's not what I'm trying to do here because there's a bit of me sometimes very very tempted with an older maturer head on to go back and say no I don't I don't want to accept the system that we have the system has been in my view designed um to create a blame culture where not only do we blame the individual social worker when there's a supposed failings but we blame the individual services and the client for their apparent failings in their life um, and, and I do sometimes get tempted to, to return, as I say, with an older, wiser head uh, to, to, to challenge that. So this, what I'm saying, I hope doesn't put people off, but in, instead maybe inspires them and almost learn from my experiences that, um, you know, the feeling isn't you. I, I had various, various comments made to me um, when I, I was I was struggling about you're just not cut out for it um, you're too soft you're too emotional um, you uh, you know comments like you just need to go and get the services are told things all those those pieces of advice from from ex what I viewed as very experienced colleagues or managers didn't didn't sit well with me because none none of that I could do. What I could do was sit and listen to clients and service users and help them interpret their situation within a bigger sort of structural um, from a, a bigger structural point of view. Uh, but what I was never comfortable with was was the blame culture that that existed not with not only within um, not only within offices between one another and social workers but also directly that individual service users and clients which just in my view further alienated them uh, and and um, the, the icing on the icing on the cake for me before I left was uh, if I could just very quickly share a, a, a little story it was um, a service user a woman a mother who was experiencing domestic violence 
um, who are children and um, are uh, being called to a child protection case conference um, to discuss the situation about the child, the risk towards the children um, and her, her relationship with the father. And the father being excluded from that meeting um, and the blame being directed at the mother in the sense that if you don't leave him, then we will have to take your children off of you. And and that and that so that's how it was framed to me prior to the meeting. Uh, and I I was forced to go and alert this woman that this is the conversation that was going to happen at this case conference. You this this is what the the chairperson is going to be saying to you. I do not want you to hear this for the first time. This is why I'm to and I felt so I felt so bad about that because one she was a victim, and um, two she was a mother of of you know of her kids and and to have that threat hanging over her just to me seemed criminal in itself. Three also the guy not the 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 partner not at any point being held to account around that table for his behaviour was, was something else altogether. Um, but what happened in the end, which as I say was icing on the cake for me about just how unjust the system was, is not only that that was a threat to this woman, but when after me having to almost break her heart the night before, um, then be around a table where that wasn't even mentioned. So it was almost like the chairperson had either forgot to mention this or had realised an error, that their error, or, or, or they changed their mind, you know, that in actual fact, they can't really say this and this isn't, this isn't the right thing to be saying. And, but it was a blase attitude and nobody then coming to me after and going, we made a bit of a mistake here. Um, and to me, that's people with quite often what happens in social work and in comparing this to my experience in further education and how we treat people is, the system has been designed that we forget that the, the service users we're working with are human beings and often they're not seen, they're not seen as our equals. And, and I've seen that with colleagues too, and that frustrated me a lot of the time. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of my that that was kind of fear from an individual point of view, but kind of pushing it out to the rest of of um sort of the system, the social work system. One thing that I've noticed and frustrated me back then and to this day still does because I'm in touch with many social workers is um, the serious lack of awareness of their social and economic system and how that then impacts on, on clients and service users, which then because so many social workers, uh, perhaps there's a feeling in education, I don't know, um, maybe lack that insight they're too they're, they're, the system is then too quick to blame the individual service user for this supposed feeling uh, and and that to me is a, a massive fear as this drive for individualism continues um that that social work social workers um and training uh, you know will will are, are missing something pretty huge here um, and that, that they're not going to change the world. They're not going to change the world unless they see the bigger picture. As many of us get into social work because we want to see a massive change in the world, and that's why I did it. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the, just one final thing. Um, I appreciate I've probably gone off on many different tangents, and hopefully somebody can bring me back. But uh, as well as that kind of lack of insight into the sort of socioeconomic policies, it's the acceptance as well, particularly within local authorities, of cuts, these supposed efficiency savings that are really just dressed, they're dressed up as efficiency savings, they're cuts, and our acceptance as, as local authority, as local authority social workers, managers, and further up the tree, to accept these cuts that get imposed on us. And just very quickly, one final thing, one thing that I'm really, really tired of seeing and, and does leave me fearful about the future of social work is um, the, all of our social media right now, I'm seeing social work friends, ex-social work, or, or social workers that I've worked with in the past, putting out pleas to families and friends for jackets, shoes, bikes, things that they can give to the families that they work with as if we are, as if we are working like a charity. And that, that leaves me with that, and not seeing the, 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 the failure in that. 
that leaves me with a lot of fear about where social work go is going in terms of the profession. Um, and I want, I want to say no. Why? Once upon a time, we were able to go and pick up money and we'd be able to uh, give that to clients or service users. Now, now that seems to not even exist. We, once upon a time, I could get twenty quid for somebody that was struggling with their gas and electric. Now, all of a sudden, we've got to go to a local food bank as if that's part of our welfare state. And that's the thing that that's probably that what, what makes me frightened the most for the social work profession. Um, and, and for people that need social work in their life. Um, so, yeah. I need to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I think there's so much there. Um, in terms of what stood out for me, I could really hear the isolation of the individual worker and, and being left, the fear coming from having to represent a system and be the face of a system, the intermediary between this great big structure and the family that you're trying to work with and the yeah. fear of what you're giving that family or offering that family, what that relationship has become. And that, and there's a, a physical discomfort left in you, a physical fear left in you that's left you ill yeah. because you've, you've been discouraged from being compassionate and, and um, working alongside that family and actually at times being told that you're being emotional that's mm. quite I was quite triggered listening back to that so I wonder there's something very gendered about that word as well yeah but it's mm -hmm. that that being that face of a very soulless system with a, not very much compassion compassion has left you with a real fear of doing that job and what you have what you are becoming as a worker that's what I heard there so and I think it's, it, although we don't want to, we're not here to put anybody off because we're all in, in some format in the profession. It is yeah. very um, important to acknowledge that. Um, I think the, the point of isolation, I know that Dan, I think you're going to talk about this past sort of year for social, for practitioners in social work. I don't think maybe we've ever been so isolated as individual workers as we are at the moment during the COVID crisis and and if you don't mind sharing your reflections on that because that really ties into what Laura said. Sure no thanks thanks Alyssa um, and thank you Laura. Um, as Alyssa knows sort of been preparing for today um, I've sort of put together uh, what were my biggest fears as a social work practitioner at the start of this year just before um, it turns 2021 so for the podcast, I thought it might be helpful um, to list what those were. And then now that we're a couple of months on to quickly look at whether those fears have materialised or not. Um, and I've sort of tried to offer a few reflections as well on that and some ideas for a response and what, what we can do uh, about fear, I suppose. So I, I listed out um, just as the as New Year was approaching uh, what was on my mind and uh, the, the the things that were kind of keeping me awake at night or occupying my uh, my 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 thoughts in the time that I had to reflect was first and foremost um, obviously at the moment the impact of, of of the virus on on our clients. So I work with um, adults with learning disabilities and autism, um, that, and it was occurring to me that there will be more hardship, isolation, and struggle without the usual resources or support for people with learning disabilities and informal carers. And that's partly because lots of services are shut down um, during the uh, during the virus for obvious reasons, but also because we lost we lost several of our clients. Lots of people that we work with very closely um, uh, were uh, sadly died because of uh, coronavirus infection. the The second thing was the on a on a much more kind of individual or, or um, microcosm level um, resources in our team. So of our team of seven, our manager was absent um, on, in the short term basis due to COVID. Um, and one of our uh, senior social workers was seconded away from the team for several months. Um, uh, there was somebody else in a court work rotor and one of the posts that we had was vacant. Um, so it was the thought of how, you know, how are we going to cope? How are we going to manage? The, the next thing was coping in social care more generally during uh, or rather post um, mature austerity, I suppose, not that austerity is over, and the virus on top of that. 
So it's a fear of failing to cope with the consequences of those and the level of support and intervention that people now require in their lives, which as um, Laura was mentioning a moment ago, is, is, um, is profound. Um, and it was specifically, from my perspective, the fear of missing vitally needed support or intervention for people or allowing abuse or neglect to take place. Um, and on a personal level, that's also the fear of complaints being made against me or legal challenges to my practice. So again, that sort of sense of being atomized and individualized um, and being directly responsible for, um, you know, the sins of the system. Um, and I was thinking, will I and other members of the team be able to cope with the resultant stress and avoid sickness absence? Will I be able to, you know, keep myself well enough? Um, and, and, and on, on top of that, of course, this um, novel situation of everybody working from home. So are we too isolated when we're working from home to be able to support one another? When you're in the office, you can at least look, look up, speak to other people. There are natural opportunities to have a chat and to see when somebody's, looking, you know, some, it's getting to someone in your team. You can't see that working from home um, or not in the same way. The next thing was about targets and performance management. So there's need for the individual and the team uh, to meet individual and team targets and to manage your reputation as a social worker. So, for example, um, due to several cases that I was dealing with last year and on, which had ongoing court hearings, casework, writing witness statements, dealing with all sorts of different things, supervisions and so on. Uh, my level of applications for court orders for a thing called deprivation of li community deprivation of liberty orders were far below the required target that I was expected to hit for that year. Uh, so it was sort of there was a, although nobody said it, but you, it's always lingering in the back of your mind a performance management measure is going to be used against me. Um, the next thing was about the eroding of social worker values and skills. So there's a fear, I think, of that I have of compromising my own values as a social worker. And I think that's a, a fight that you have from the minute that you enter the profession um, and it never goes away. Um, and you, when you come under the pressure, the combination of the, um, the issues that I've just been talking about, um, you start to wonder, are you keeping the, the, the service use of the client at the centre of your practice? Are you working in a human rights informed way? Am I trying to work to the social model of disability? To what extent do I adhere to the code of practice or even, even basic social work training of active listening, empathising and trying to empower service users? Um, and the answer is very often in the cold light of day, no, there's big compromise there. The, the next thing is um, about the fragility of um, the workplace or practitioner voice. So um, I'm a trade union rep. Um, uh, in my workplace um, and I'm always wondering to myself as well am I doing enough to represent our members particularly during Covid when lots of people were um, being encouraged to come back into the workplace when it wasn't um, it wasn't necessary to do so and we, we are we, we felt was placing people at risk we had outbreaks in the workplace um, so was I making the case clearly enough around keeping social workers and other local authority social workers safe? Were there times when I was going too far and my card was being marked by management? All of that plays out, um, was playing out in my mind. So that's the sort of um, maelstrom of different concerns <laughs> and fears that I had in my mind uh, at the end of the year. And now uh, a couple of months on, um, some of those concerns have turned to a reality. So my manager's still away, but for other reasons, and there are several other people in the wider service away at the moment, including people off due to stress. And we're finding, hard in it to, finding it harder to allocate cases than we normally would, including responding in reasonable time frames to things like safeguarding inquiries. Um, and as I said, sadly, over, uh, over the Christmas and New Year period, we've lost yet more adults with learning disabilities that we know and supported to, to COVID. So what that tells me, I suppose, is that my fears aren't irrational, although they might be slightly exaggerated in my mind at times. So what I want to talk about now is sort of reflecting on those fears a little bit. Um, so my main thoughts were that probably those fears are actually very common fears which unite me with other practitioners um, and just as Laura was saying and made the point extremely well in the context of neoliberal and individualized case-based based social work we can be further siloed and fearful when we're working from home than in the workplace at least when in the workplace you have the team around you um, 
losing one's skills and professional decision making in an ability to rush for the completion of tasks or deadlines um, can be um, uh, can, can be a concern it can be a, can be a trap and the thing is that those are encoded i think into social care it systems and the way that our work is div divided up electronically and that's a you know it's something that swan's been writing about for many years and this is now a mature chronic problem in social work this isn't anything new it's you know it's absolutely part of the modus operandi of um, local authority social work um i think conversely these tasks and processes can offer a sort of attempting pr protective blanket, um, which can provide a barrier between the practitioner and human need or suffering. So you can turn away from the, uh, the brutal reality of the work that you're doing and just to turn it into, well, I've got to write up this set of minutes or get this, you know, get this assessment completed or whatever. But is that a healthy and appropriate thing to do? It can stop us from feeling uncomfortable or even harrowing feelings, I suppose. And the question, there's a question of whether fear, anxiety and, the, um, and unease should be accepted as part of the social work role more than, um, than, than other jobs. You know, is it, does it come with the territory? Should we accept that? So I thought a little bit more about an ideas for a response um, or ideas for action, because I suppose this, that's what this is about, isn't it? It's about um, how, how do we deal with fear? What do we do about that experience? Um, so um, I, I, one obvious thing that happened to me was in preparing for the podcast just after the new year, um, I had a chat with Alyssa because we were trying to put this together and have some ideas for it. Um, and I found that I really enjoyed that, just having a conversation um, uh, and connecting with somebody, um, particularly um, with somebody who works in a different field, in a different area, uh, but yet still having a lot of common ground and commonalities. Um, so it seems to me we need need those peer level forums to be talking about how we're feeling and resisting the sort of sense of siloing. And we need to create, I think, in this context of home based working, um, which makes it even harder. A, uh, but I suppose it goes for standard, the standard workplace um, situation in any case, a strong rights based practitioner narrative. So in other words, what do we do? You know, are we talking about how do we talk about social work to one another? How do we talk about our clients? Uh, do we, we do we use empowering language? Do we, uh, you know, are we talking about uh, current trends and, and themes in social work or are we, you know, uh, is the conversations that we have uh, about struggling under weight of getting hitting deadlines and targets? Um, so that might be in terms of trying, trying to change that tide, some of that might be about being honest about fear and using the term fear openly. It's interesting, we, we, you know, Laura, when you were talking a moment ago about stress, that actually we use that term stress and stress very often comes from fear. Uh, and, but we never use the word fear. And it may be because we're fearful that it makes us look weak um, or that it can be turned against us. But I think in actual, it also has power, that word, and more accurately describes perhaps some of the experiences that we have on a day to day basis. So I thought also, what about reintroducing and reappropriating positive concepts of right based practice, person centered care, and in my instance, concepts like independent living? How are we using those? Um, you know, are, are those discussed in the workplace? Can, do you, can you have a, a professionals meeting where you talk about those, th those sorts of things? Are there those sorts of opportunities at work? Can you create them, even if they're in the finest of margins? Um, and what practitioner forums are that discuss those issues locally and nationally, nationally and how can you create them if they don't exist? There are often functioning service user involvement platforms, some that may have more integrity than others, and some that are statutory. So in my case, there's things like learning disability partnership boards and autism boards. And is there a practitioner representation on them? Um, how can we bring that, if you like, the rank and file, the frontline social work practitioner voice forward so we have the, you know, the, the reality, the honesty about what we do um, comes true through. Um, and then last of all, how can we encourage stronger trade unions and protect the time to encourage social workers to get together and formulate a priori their, their priorities and concerns? So um, those, I think, are, are, are questions to think about and, and, and ways of addressing this. So, um, so yeah, that was mainly what I had to say. Thank you, Dan. Um, I also enjoyed our chat. <laughs> um, I, I, 
I found it really useful, that conversation that we had to suddenly realize the point that you've highlighted there, that fear is a real part of my job. And yet I don't use that word at work. And I don't use that word for fear of being told that I'm overreacting or it, it being linked to this emotional concept that Laura highlighted. But actually there are numerous ways, too many ways that fear is generated in my job. And, it, and to not acknowledge it is actually, you know, a real disservice to the real, you know, to acknowledging the reality of what's going on. So, um, to, you know, for example, today at work, I had an hour, this is highly unusual, I can't remember the last, last time this happened, I had an hour with my manager to discuss a case that has been keeping me awake at night, which boils down to what you highlighted about resources. There is real fear, I have physical physical fear that keeps me awake at night about a case where there are two choices either abuse continues for children or we remove and and those are the only two options that have been made available to me because of a lack of resources it, it's not your typical case it um requires a lot more compassion there are if you use your imagination you can think of the resources you can identify the missing pieces of the jigsaw but they don't exist those services don't exist anymore in, in our community. And so I'm left with two options, neither of which I'm happy with, but because I have to represent that, and I said, I have to say to my boss, it'll be me that has to go and say the position of the local authority. It'll be me that has to take children physically away from their parents after a court process. I'm frightened of that. That creates real fear for me. And it's not because, interestingly, as Laura said, and as Dan's conversations highlighted, it doesn't come from the service users. It's not fear of being punched in the face, although that might come after the court process. It's a fear of what I represent and what I have to deliver. And I think that's it's important for me, maybe, to use that word with more confidence and recognise when that's happening in practice and be more, be more realistic with my bosses about when that's really happening. Um, Brian, I wonder if if we can come to you now, just for that, almost that uh, looking in from the outside point of view, someone who's considered for a lot longer maybe than we have, the areas where fear is generated, which seem to be just everywhere at the moment, especially during COVID, and the reality of, um, you know, the role that fear plays in our practice and what we can be, what we should be thinking about. Sorry, Brian, we're, you're muted. Apologies. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Now, this is a research project we don't need to do because we know the answer already. What is the most used phrase in the last year around the world? And it is, you're muted. Can you please unmute? So my apologies, folks. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, but um, so, so thank you to Laura and Dan because um, I've got a few things I'd like to cover um, but for particular areas but it, it what you what you're saying is it took me back actually to some of my stuff on my own fear and, and what you said as well um, in terms of that so I am I was just remembering as people were talking there about me kicking off in my social work career so a long while ago now folks okay long while ago and I remember when I started as a qualified social worker in London, some of the families and children I was working with, I'd go home, I went to sleep worried about some of those situations, and I'd wake up worried about those situations. And I had to find a way of coping with that. And you know what, it never quite occurred to me, but you know what, that was fear. I'd never actually seen it quite like that. I was just trying to get used to it and how do I manage it? Um, but I think the whole thing about fear has got much more of a currency, unfortunately, than we try and give credence to. And I think everyone's been saying in there, how do we need to think about association with ourselves and others so that we feel stronger and that we're not feeling as though we're isolated and individualized and it's me. Is it me just feeling like this? Well, do you know what? No, it's not. And there's something there about how our bureaucratic managerialism 
and as you know has been said about the the, the neoliberal approaches which have become so strong in in recent decades makes that association more difficult and therefore becomes more vital for us to do in a number of ways and again thinking about when i kicked off so long ago in in our profession um it was a long time ago folks but i remember about the issues about community work and community action i was a local authority social worker we did bits of community action community work and we were there and we were looking at the rights of not just individuals, but of communities that were disadvantaged in, in some of the areas I worked with uh, and ways of actually dealing with that. So in a way, I'd like to think we were in some small way challenging some of those discriminatory and oppressive areas across a range of things. Um, but we, we, we had that as part of our brief and I've seen that kind of disappear over, over, over my career. And I, no, the, I think the reason for that is that within local authorities become much more concerned with inspection, the types of inspections, what that means, and the blame culture that we've seen come along, particularly in the last 20 or 30 years. So as, as a social worker, um, I used to enjoy it, and I'm sure people still do. In the social, I, I, I do enjoy that association. I think it was a different way of thinking about it at that point. So I think within the context of what's being demanded, particularly in local authorities, those issues that people have been bringing up about individualization, about feelings that am I, could I be seen as being weak about raising this? The question for me is how do we flip that on its head and, and people have been saying that dan's been saying it laura's saying it. it it's incumbent on us as a profession to try and get some confidence to feel as though we can actually speak to each other and relate to each other i think dan you were starting to say this in terms of some of the things that you've started to do there um because i know i need that association to work well and feel good about what i'm doing I, i'm not very good just working on my own so how do we get that bit of working with others, supporting each other's because the in the main, and it's not everywhere and it's not everyone, but I think that the, 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 the real direction of travel has been and will continue to be for a while, the bit about managers and supervisors feeling under pressure from their targets and their way they're meant to be doing things because they get seen within their bureaucracy and managerial approaches in a certain way. So they kind of come to take that on board with maybe some, you know, some of the best will in the world about what they do, get caught up in all of that. So how do we do that to challenge it, to make sure that I don't go into work on a Monday morning or leave on a Friday afternoon, feeling as though I'm doing an awful job and I'm not being supported in doing that. And for me, that's a really crucial bit, because I think the effects of fear, which can come from a number of areas, are personal, emotional and professional. So in the research I've done in areas of mental health and, and, and safeguarding children work, um, there really are personal effects on people. And that can be from the pressure of the work. And just to, to, to put it slightly differently, there are situations because of the role that we have to undertake, that dual role. I think we're unique in what we do. We actually do care and control. Like it or not, we've got that control bit, which, do you know what? Not many other professions have, actually. It's us who do, do those bits. I mean, Dan, talking about dolls, mental health, that stuff. I can be, as an AMP, involved in some of the most serious <laughs> effects of a professional decision that anyone in our country makes. If I sign that bit of paper, the effect on that person is absolutely extraordinary in so many ways. If I'm doing that bit that Lisa, you were talking about, that, that decision about you know children and Laura, you were talking about, I don't do it, the courts do it, but I am part of a system <laughs> that is part of saying, do you know what? You're not a good enough parent. And however well we do it, if I'm a parent, that's how I'm gonna feel about it. So actually there are a very small proportion of situations we're involved in, particularly with men actually, 
uh, of men who are violent and controlling who do pretty nasty things to us in social not just social and others but we're a main target and we are one of the professions that is most at risk of, of violence and aggression and i think if we carry on not acknowledging that we've got a problem and actually we do know it's much better in physical abuse now for example when i started my work people didn't used to report physical abuse they thought it was part of the job well no it's not part of the job it it and we don't necessarily want to be punitive about our responses but i think we need to deal with those bits as well so there are issues it comes from our role which is problematic and we've got to be clear about our role and how we explain that to our service users and carers um but that is part of what we're doing, care, control. No one else, I would argue, does that. And that's part of us having to make sure with our support systems, with our employers, that that's recognised and we're supported both personally and professionally. Because also, you know, in, in particularly in the safeguarding children work, and if people want to, sorry, I'm going to carry on too long. I'm going to bring on some of the other areas soon, OK, folks? But please, if people want to email me, readily available, look at the University of Hertfordshire website, put my name in, my email address will come up. Very happy to communicate with evidence about these different areas. So, different levels, personal, emotional, and professional about how I feel about my job and how well I'm doing my job for those who are some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Part of that is, in our agencies, it gets not just about being unsupportive and managerial, but actually bullying. We know that, that bullying is now a real feature. Maybe it's because managers are feeling under pressure. But OK, why would they accept that and put that culture into place? But it's becoming more and more a feature, as I understand it. Uh, and therefore, the things that Dan's talking about in terms of our trade unions, our other forms of association, SWAN, professional associations, absolutely vital so that we are not individualised, because that's, that's what some employers <laughs> And some supervisors and managers who aren't sure about their role or whatever it might be, they, they are going down a certain route that we have to challenge. And it's very difficult just on our own. Because as we say, it can feel the processes can mean say we're blamed. I think, Dan, you mentioned about complaints. One little area in, in some of my research that I did, I was quite surprised by the number of people who came out and said, actually, our real worry is about complaints and the way complaints are dealt with. Um, and I feel as though I'm, I'm the one who's in trouble straight away, but how am I supported? If I have a complaint made against me, you know what, it might be one which is not correct. But it seems as though lots of people who have complaints made against them don't feel supported. They feel as though there's like, they're seen in a different way because those complaints are being made. So I think there's something in there about support of staff that we need to demand in agencies um, to overcome some of what can be a bullying complaint. Uh, everyone's got a right to make complaints. It's not that's not the issue. It's how they're dealt with and how staff are supported in relation to that. Otherwise, it affects our professional confidence and our professional space. And I think I've heard what Laura and Dan were saying. There was it's that professional space. It's been so limited now. How confident do I feel as a professional? because I feel fearful about how I'm going to be judged, what could the repercussions be? And there are many ways that can happen in organisations these days. And if we think about on another level, um, some of the other stuff I've done is about whistleblowing. OK, and um, every professional code now has something in it since the um, mid staffs inquiry to say that we have a duty to whistleblow if we think there's dangerous practice, either in our own agencies or an agency, you know, those that we deal with from, you know, what should I call them? Independent sector. <laughs> OK, the private sector. All right. And some of the issues that go on in the private sector that we know are the case that, that might lead to issues not being dealt with as well as they might be when there's a breach of our service users rights and needs. And, and you look at that and you think, OK, we know lots of people don't whistle blow because of exactly the, what the circumstances are. And I think the fear that can come from that in thinking, I know there's something not quite right here. You know, there, there, were, there were social workers involved in Winterbourne View, okay? 
there were there were social workers working at Mid Staffordshire in the hospital, where there was a bullying culture not to say that things were going wrong when people knew they were. But for me, there are lots of ways in which we have to be thinking about rights of our service users and carers, but rights of ourselves as well. So if we don't feel confident, then how are we going to feel confident on behalf of, 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 our, of our service users and carers when we need to be doing that? So I think there's something about us feeling as though we can be more assertive about our needs. And there are ways of doing that. And the two, two examples of that is one in terms of all, um, Dan, you mentioned about someone's been away from work. And I think Laurie yourself as well. All that stuff we have now, as good as it might be or not so good, all those return to work processes and about the well-being of staff through legislation comes from someone called John Walker, who was a senior social worker up in the northeast of England, who was left to deal with all of his, pretty much all of the families being worked with because he was short-staffed. He started to have a mental health problem, went off sick, came back. The only thing that had changed for John Walker was that he'd got more, we're going back a while now, folks, literally had case files piled up on his desk in his room. He had more of them. Went off sick again, never came back. We'd now go in those days, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's a bit of a history lesson, but, but now go before Unison, you know, um, they took the case up and they won that case in the court that he hadn't been supported properly for the stresses and the fear that he had of going to that office every morning, looking at this, like, what on earth do I do about all these needs and difficulties and not being supported? So John Walker is the reason why we've got those things in place. They are there for people to use. And it is, okay, we've got about stress and whatever else. I think stress is an individualized thing is a problem. Okay, it, it, it's a way of saying you're stressed. You're, no, it's the situation which is stressing me. I may have my own bits as well, but it's within this context of the work and that dual role that I'm doing that can bring me that fear. The other one is Alison Taylor, who was the whistleblower in North Wales, in the North Wales inquiry, where there was enormous abuse going on that people knew about. Alison Taylor wasn't being listened to, went outside to a lawyer and a reporter, blew the whole lot, was sacked for doing that. Um, and eventually she was, um, it was proven this was the case and that she was correct and should never have been sacked, okay? So the whistleblowing bit and the fear from that from the rights of our service users and carers is where all that came from as well. So actually, two social workers, enormously important in these areas we're talking about on a general level. Um, so if I'm fearful about whistleblowing, how do we think about we support each other through our associations to do that? Because I am going to be scared. I know what's going to happen to me if I report something like that. OK, so I have got to feel secure and confident to overcome that fear because it will be there. I know I would have it. So we all have to think about it together, I think. So for me, I think it's about association. It's about community, recognizing that there's fear, what it's about, and moving away from that individual blame culture, which has been such a feature, I think. Um, you, know, see, you know, serious case reviews. They say they're gonna change them around now, not blaming social workers, mm, maybe. The ones I've seen recently have been quite so much in that vein as I might like to see. You know, it's about systems rather than individuals. So, okay, I, I think I need to finish now because I could go on forever. I, I get quite passionate about this and I wander off in all sorts of ways. It's about working together because we've all got similar issues. We need to think about how we do it. So it's not just down to me going home of a Friday night, absolutely fearful about what I've done that week, what will come, and what I might be blamed for if something goes mm. wrong. Absolutely. And I'll put it in inverted commas, okay? Go yeah. Ahead. I think what, what I was thinking there, Brian, when you were talking is actually, when we're fearful walking into work, we're much more easily controlled, aren't we? It's, it's much harder for us to challenge uh, big structural problems if we're very fearful about the caseload we carry and the mistakes we, we might get blamed for. And it's a real control technique, actually. But it's one, it's one that I suppose, Social Protection Network talks about, but it's also one that has 
disastrous consequences. If we don't, as a profession, challenge the role that fear is playing in our day-to-day -day practice, we are losing really well-qualified, experienced workers and leaving far less qualified, far less experienced workers to carry the ca remaining caseload. And, um, and it has a really negative it takes the bottom out of social work almost and it reduces the quality of what we're doing so it's actually in everybody's interests to to cooperate together and try to strengthen each other and address the what why we're fearful why fear is such a big part of our work but it does feel like quite an easy way to control us i don't know what other people think about that I, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, it was interesting what Brian was saying as well, Lisa. I, I was reflecting on what Brian said about um, the community action and the sort of community social work that was part of the role when he first started as a social worker. And of course, that's something that we read about um, when we're on social work training courses and about patch based social work um, and how that sort of was a, you know, a, a fad maybe for a while. Um, but but was a uh, you know was a part of the social work role which is now um, what you know got long since gone and I remember Jeremy Weinstein from Swan talking about the fact that he felt that when he was a practitioner there was more what he called wiggle room so, mm -hmm. wiggle, so what he meant by that was you could just get away with a bit more there was a bit more license to be able to you know to, to to be able to try things and to be able to do you know just get away with um doing more to help your 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 client or to be on their be on their side um in a way that maybe isn't so possible now and that is about i think neoliberalism that is about the fact that we're individualized and it suits us it suits the system for us to be fearful and scared and divided um, so I think, you, so not one is just to get sucked back into what we we're talking about before. The thing is that I think whatever you can do to try and create, the, as Brian put it, association, whatever you can do to try and talk to one another and create forums, even if they seem pretty, um, what's the word, uh, even if they pre seem, seem pretty tame or pretty minor to begin with, it kind of grows from there. I remember Michael Lavalette once talking about how there was, I'm forgetting the name of the place now, is it Wishaw near Glasgow, Laura? Yeah, the, the, uh, they, they started up a campaign there. I think it's quite, a, it's not an especially radical place, I don't think, but they what they were saying was uh, there, they started by a campaign by everybody just taking a lunch break. And that was their kind of, but, but the sad- Wow, some rebellion. Uh, it's fairly <laughs> radical. Oh, no, it is, it is, yeah. Isn't that weird? It is actually, isn't it? Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's really concerning, isn't it? It, that's really it, was just, it just sort of came from there. Sorry, carry on. Yeah. No, I think, well, I mean, it's on that level, allowing people to take a lunch break together so that then maybe they can communicate and touch base. And gosh, all the information yeah. that will be passed yeah. between. How, how, how awful to, to work in a system that won't, won't really allow you. I think, I think it's, it, it's like culture. So like the culture's changed probably so much. You'll have seen that, Brian, you maybe Dan as well, have seen how the culture has changed. Um, and I, I, I know exactly the campaign that Michael was talking about um, and, and, and how, how small a thing, yet how very powerful. I've worked in teams where everybody would sit at their desk and have their lunch. And I've worked in teams um, where if you sat at your desk, people would look at you and say, why are you still sitting at your desk? It's your lunch hour. Uh, and, and it would depend on the culture of the of the team. And just the, the point that I think both Brian and um, Dan had made um, about, about find, finding those little opportunities to be together, which is, is, is so much more difficult now, particularly because of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and, us, and us doing this homework in which I, my, my fear is, is the agenda is, that, is something that's going to get pushed on us um, anyway, um, is that local authority, certainly where I am and what the local authority next to me, um, is uh, in the process of closing down buildings. And that, you know, and this, the, 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 the badness that was hot desking, do you remember when that came in and all of a sudden you didn't even have a desk? Now you don't even get hot desking. Now there's this like, expectation that you're working at home and, as buildings get closed, we lose that culture of, of that community of social work. 
lunchers together. Yeah. Like you can all go off to lunch together and you can say, right, that you know, we're off and no, I don't want to have a phone call over my lunch and this is protected time for us and this is when we can whether it be talk about Coronation Street or, you know, talk about something that's concerning me um, and that sort of camaraderie that you would have had. And I think as we see things like um, local authorities closing buildings, where there's no, not only do you not even have as social workers a place to go and um, and be and be a team and, and have your identity, the identity of the social work office and the community has disappeared. Gone. Absolutely. I was nodding when Brian was talking about um, community action and community work. I came into social work when I'm, I'm sad to say I think that was dead. And I kept thinking, I've done the wrong degree. <laughs> like, I've done the wrong degree. That what I've, I should have done community development or something. I'm in the wrong... I, 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 my idea of social work is way off. I'm, I'm in the wrong place. Um, to the extent that now... Or certainly when I worked in social work, and I think it's probably worse now, if you were ever as a social worker to suggest that a service user complain to their local councillor, you would have to say it in a whisper and say, but don't say I said, this isn't my suggestion that you should go to your councillor to complain about your damp that's causing asthma on your kid, and then it's written in a, a child protection report as a cause for concern. Roughly. So, so once upon a time, what Brian was talking about, that, that to me, that, that's why I got into social work. That's what excited me about the, the, the prospect of, 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 you know, building communities to get in and having an identity as, of us on, whether it be on the high street um, or whether it be, you know, in the local town centre. That's gone now. Buildings are gone. Um, and I think that there's, there's been a very subtle and insidious plan to deprofessionalise us because we can be powerful. Um, as you got, you, you pointed out, Brian, we can be very, we can be a powerful force, and they know that, and that's why I think um, they they have have made every effort to silence people like me who go, this doesn't feel right. I think this is wrong, and make me feel a bit silly and like I'm maybe doing the job wrong. Um, and that, I, you, that you're not that you're not what social work's about anymore yeah. it's uh -huh. the yeah. the understanding of what social work is and the purpose of the profession i think one thing that's really interesting and it doesn't surprise me you know that laura and brian that you're both in in education around uh, social work or social care i think there's there's this um an interesting role for further education because there are many university social work degrees that still teach um, politics as part of social work degrees that still teach, um, you know, what what we kind of call radical social work, but wasn't, that's quite a new thing, it just used to be social work, um, and still teach, you know, theories of sociology as part of their social work degree, but there's also a new type of social work education, which um, is much more based on being in the office and learning on the job. Now, as somebody who went from a university degree into the job and realized that they were two completely, that, you know, what I learned in my degree and the job were two completely different things. And I wasn't fearful in my degree or my placements and suddenly I was fearful doing the job. I can understand why students want to learn what social work is in reality in the office on some of these one year or two year education courses. But what, what is, there is quite an important role, isn't there, I would suggest, for further education, for teaching us um, how to manage fear and as a profession, teaching us how to reduce fear in practice because it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be a scary job. I don't know what everybody else thinks about that. Brian, do you have a, a kind of perspective? I, I can always talk about this stuff till kingdom come. So I, I don't, Dan and Laura want to say something first, and, and I do have a feeling. Oh, carry on, Brian. Well, I'm really intrigued to see what you've got here, to, what you've got okay. to say. It comes to that stuff about resilience, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. th th there's a whole lot of stuff around here. This, this will go on for a couple of days, I'm afraid, I think, from this discussion we're having. This stuff about resilience. Okay. Again, that's an individualized thing, potentially. I think resilience, for me, I know resilience comes from what people are saying here. It's those little discussions every day. It's those little bits that build up over time. It's not in a particular session that's organized on Zoom or whatever. It comes from starting to trust people, 
that we can do something, we can start to recognize stuff, first of all. So I think this is important, this conversation is about recognizing fear. And we own it and take it back again and do something with it. Because if, if I think there's an idea we're kind of avoiding the term at the moment. So it's owning it, but making use of it to do something positive with it between us. So in terms of uh, sort of education and training, uh, we're expected to maybe help people get be resilient. Yes, of course, but it's the way we think about resilience. And I think there's something in there about helping people to understand the sort of stuff that, that you're talking about at the moment as a way of being resilient. It isn't just about my own psychology <laughs> and what that means, internal. It's to do with how I relate to others and feel as though I get power from that and not feeling powerless because it's individualized on me. And I think different courses do things very differently in that way. And actually, mm, there's one particular new form of training, which kind of pretty much airbrushes out the sociological and structural bit absolutely. almost completely, I would suggest. Yeah. And it's one, that's favored, it's one that's favored by government at the moment, I think. And don't get me wrong, it's got some good things to it, but it's a particular focus that takes away from all the important issues I think that we're talking about at the moment, at those structural level. Yeah, issues. and we need to not think that that's an accident uh, by the government, that yeah. that's just a coincidence. This is a, a, a way to push us. Dan, did you, did you have something to come in with there? Have I just put you on the spot? You have a bit, because I had to, I did have that in mind and I've forgotten what it was now. So <laughs> something that Brian was saying, it'll come back to me, you carry on. <laughs> I think, I think it, I, I think it comes back to that sense of control, that, that how easily controlled we are with certain, with certain structures in place, certain, you know, allowing certain fears to grow. And I think the thing about what, what's happening to further education now is that we do have to fight for our good quality, lengthier further education courses, because that is where communities are built um you know between students and students and academics that's where academics can come and stand alongside practitioners and and those um because there's often too i don't know i feel that there's often too much of a divide between what what you can <clears throat> learn from an academic and what you can learn from a practitioner and actually we need to see that as all part and parcel of one social work profession that can actively reduce fear and danger in the profession for both practitioners and for the, the families and individuals that we're working with. Um, one, one of the, sorry Dan, okay. I'm losing my voice, I've been on Zoom all day. Um, uh, yeah, getting back to Zoom, one, one of the things that's happening in Scotland right now um, in further education um, and um, the EIS uh, FILA, uh, further education part of the union, uh, is challenging is that uh, th there's this new notion that uh, lecture posts will be replaced with instructor posts, which essentially um, means that uh, I, I could keep, I think the way my understanding is I'll keep my job as a lecturer, but if I was to say retire or go off, I wouldn't be replaced with a lecturer, I would be replaced with an instructor post. Um, having done a very similar job, um, Previously, prior to getting into lecturing, uh, it meant five days facing a classroom with no preparation, no marking time, which basically meant that your quality and your standard was really, really reduced. Uh, and, and that's something that, that's going ahead in some colleges already in Scotland and we've balloted uh, for strike action because we can see it coming. Um, and they'll come up with all sort of excuses around I don't even, I, I, I don't believe, I, I can't even justify it myself, so, but they will come up with all sorts of excuses around how to justify, uh, again, deprofessionalising lecturers as well. Um, and it's, it's basically just getting more for less, in my view, and, and further exploitation. And what will happen is that students that are coming in to say, for example, health and social care, my fifth year, you won't get the same level of input or quality or standard. And the impact then is on service users in the future because these are going to be your future carers, our future social care workers, and those that are then going to go to university to become our social workers. So it's, it's so insidious. It's so it's all these little subtle things that I think we need to see in the grand the grand scheme of things. Um, and 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 also something that I see coming and that concerns me greatly and gives me a lot of fear is this this 
this new agenda of this digital age. And I mean, I'm 38 and I, I consider myself a dinosaur because I resist it all the time. Um, it has a place. I understand technology in the digital world has a place. But when we hear things like robots in care homes, you know, or um, what courses such as nursing and social work going online, it just fills me with dread. Who is making these decisions? Because to me, that, that there's not value being placed on these professions if we think that we can replicate any sort of relationship-based work um, by doing it this way. And I see it coming, and, and, it, and it fills me with, as I say, a lot of fear. I, I was going to mention a moment ago was um, a, a, just kind of building on on some of what you're saying there, Laura, and what Brian was talking about in terms of how resilience is used in my organisation. So we all had um, everybody sat at home dealing with their stresses and anxieties of the you know their their daily work pressure. We were told by our manager, right? So we're going to have a session on resilience. Everybody's got to join it. It's going to be at half past ten on Thursday morning. It's, you know, you've got to be there um, and, uh, you know, and uh, we'll, we'll learn about resilience. So we did this and it was, to be fair, it was, it was run by our, one of our um, equalities officers in the, um, in the local authority. And she's a nice woman and she, you know, it was, it, it, she, she ran it to the best of, best of her ability. And there was some relatively interesting stuff about um, relaxation techniques and things of that nature. But everybody, a lot of people were sat there with their cameras off. Uh, there was a, sec a, se a section where they played some some kind of like, uh, you know, meditative music, I suppose it was, and everybody sort of sat there. And it just felt to me like it was, you know, it wasn't it, it, embarrassing, but it was it, it, it just felt like it was so disconnected yeah. um, and it, it, it couldn't possibly really replicate, um, you know, what, the, what we're talking about, which is that sense of connection by people speaking to one another. And it felt it felt faintly ridiculous because we're all from, uh, you know, sat at home, all um, divided from one another, you know, just interacting by, 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 by video. So, yeah, I mean, I, I sympathise with some of what you're saying there, Laura, if this is the future it's a pretty atomized and frightening uh kind of divorced from one another type future isn't it and so, several things quickly if i may is um of course that's part of the culture isn't it of, yeah, okay so everyone's been inoculated now they've had a session on resilience it fits with the checklist bit so at the meetings around and say, oh, what have you done about resilience? Oh, we have the course. Fantastic. Let's move on. And it's not, that's not in a, it's not about owning stuff about staff care as an organization. It's an inoculation. So it's going to be okay in the checklist bit. And the bit that Laura was saying that you referred to there, Dan, is that are we are we going to end up as operatives or are we professionals? So you get called an instructor. We know what instructor is. That's not a lecturer, is it? And those bits about professionalism, about what you do, and same as a social worker. Am I going to be an operative or am I going to be a professional? And, and that's not to diminish what people do in those technical ways, but it's more complex than that, I think, both in lecturing and education, you know, and teaching and learning and what we do. And I think that's one of the things we have to, yeah, be very aware of and, and, and part of taking the best we can in 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 in, in you know in our everyday things that we do i think um i think i'll try and i mean i don't think i will do a very good job here of summing up but i think i'll try and sum up with some of the things that that we've identified that we could do i think this is going to sound very trite and it will and it will sound like it's coming from the person who sent down the enforced resilience training but in an age where, to start, you know, to start the phrase like that, in an age where we may not have buildings to return back to, where certainly service users aren't allowed to come and find us, in an age where finding us online is incredibly difficult, I struggle to find my colleagues, you know, through, through those kind of online portals. Um, in an age where we work entirely through computer screens, actually, conversation, free-flowing conversation in a safe setting, so on the telephone, not, not just, you know, with a headset on, but actually on the telephone or going for a walk with a colleague or having a meal with a colleague, if, if you can, um, or even 
encouraging councils to have touchdown bases so that you can at least get an, a desk in a, in a building somewhere, even if it's hot desking, is potentially going to save some of us from succumbing to the fear because we've lost human contact. And so we have to have that or we won't be able to keep going as a profession. We need to be able to have a conversation and we need to have a conversation that uses the word fear more often. We need to be much more comfortable with talking about the role that fear is playing in our practice and not just call it stress and anxiety because it isn't, it isn't just stress. It's a deep in your stomach fear sometimes um, and value the structural conversations so that we don't think as individuals it's our fault that things are that we're losing control of things you know that we're bad practitioners but think there are bigger things happening here and I can see it and I can feel it and that's where the fear is coming from um that would be my sort of attempt at summing up and and it, again it is that kind of community and touching base with people and making connections with people either through your, your union or through SWAN or just people in your team that recognize you're a good practitioner but feeling fearful don't know if in closing there if anybody else feels before we finish that that there should be anything that needs adding to that not cracking okay <laughs> thank you everyone i will um i'll press um stop recording and and um i'd just like to say thank you very much to everyone for contributing i think we could keep going for days but want hmm. to just force ourselves to stop but thank you very much